Hi class, this is uh, Professor Nick Sensky at UNC Charlotte, and this is the week three skills video for Grasshopper um, as part of computational methods. So what I'm uh, going to talk about today is going to be a continuation of the topics that we uh, studied last week. And if you recall, we were talking about um, variables, right, it, with respect to the way that we position objects and the way that we transform objects. And so again, we're gonna, we're gonna go ahead and start there today. If you remember, I had, uh, we were using um, a point object as a way to move a center box, right? And uh, we took, we had a point and a center box. And the center box is always started off at zero, 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 right? Because that's where the base plane was. And we took a point and an XY plane. And <clears throat> if you added a number slider to your point, for instance, uh, in the X axis, you move the point, which would move the plane or it would change where the plane was generated, right? The plane's position, um, <clears throat> which would then locate your box, okay? So a big thing was about how a lot of the objects that we use actually start off on zero, 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 and then we reposition them using a point or using a plane or some other thing, okay? Uh, and this was different from using a move, which actually changes the state of the object afterwards, okay? Remember that from lecture? So what I want to focus on right now, though, is this uh, point, OK? Let's assume that if you have a point, then then you can reposition uh, most objects that you're going to be using, so like curves and solids, things like that. So we have a point object. And if I, I know that if I change the value in one of these directions, right, it's going to move that uh, point, OK? What I'm going to do is a little bit different uh, than this. So I've got slider and it controls uh, the one variable, right? I have one value. Okay, I'll go ahead and get, get rid of this. We're gonna do a series component <clears throat> and it says a series of numbers. And a series component lives under math. Um, Try to find it, actually it might, might be under uh, actually sets, sorry, it's under sets, under series, okay. But we can just type it in. So a series component generates a series of numbers to list right now. It defaults to a list from zero to nine, and this is important. Uh, so the S is the first number, and usually defaults to zero. And in computers, we start counting from zero, and that's helpful because you think about Cartesian space, right? The ground is usually a Z of zero right? Uh, zero, zero, zero is the origin. So that makes sense, even uh, even to us, okay? So zero. N is the step size, so that's the number that you'll add to this. So it's a zero, one, two, so it's an increment of one. And then C is the number of values, so how many times are you going to add this number to this number? <clears throat> and that's going to give you um, a series, okay? Let's go ahead and I'll throw up a panel here just so we get a sense of what's going on with this. And you can see our numbers here. Let's make some sliders. So one number slider is going to be what that first number is going to be. So we can call this S. And you can see that as I increase that number, one is added to it, and there's 10 numbers. And then the second one is going to be the number that I add to it. So if I make it something reasonable here. So you can say 2 plus 4 is 6, plus 4 is 10, and so on. And then lastly, let's go ahead and add uh, one for the number of things. And let's go ahead and make this like 15 or something, and make it uh, integer numbers. Let's go ahead and fix this up. To n, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, yeah. 
go ahead and kind of space these up. There we go. Let's see. So I've got 2, 6, 10, 14, right? And I can keep increasing. 11, so I get 0 to 10. This is the index of the number, so the 0 off 1 is 2, the first one, second one to the 10th, 11 numbers. Okay? So series are pretty useful, right? Because they make a series of numbers. And that's important in Grasshopper uh, because there's an effect. So when we had one variable and we plugged it in for this number, we got one point. If you plug in a series of numbers or multiple numbers into a point, you actually get multiple objects. Okay, so if I look at that, this one inherits 11 values. Make another panel here. That gives me 11 points. This is the x coordinate, y z coordinate. Okay. And so now we can ha take these and, you know, again, if I move the initial, I move the initial position, that's zero, change n, that's kind of the spacing between them, because that's the number that I add to each one in the x, and then c is the number. And that's pretty useful. <clears throat> Just to demonstrate the point, I can use this to generate the planes. And I can use this to make my center boxes, right? So now I've got, I can do a collection of boxes at each of those points, okay? So that's a series component. And the big idea, again, is that in Grasshopper, if you input multiple values for a variable, you actually get multiple objects, right? Or multiple states of that object. That's a series component, okay? The other kind of component I want to look at is a range component. And a range lives under sets, if you go under sequence here. Range, okay? Creates a range of numbers. And a range is, is a little bit different from a series. They're, they bear some similarity, but they're a little bit different. So let's go ahead and uh, look at it. See, so a range is a range right now. It says 11 locally defined values. It's between 0 and 1. And increment looks like it's uh, 0.1. But it doesn't work the same as a series. It only has two values. It has a domain, which is a range. So it says from what number to what number. So 0 to 1. And then n is the number of steps. So let's go ahead and since we had this one, which is basically whole numbers, let's just plug this one in for n. D, if you look at this, it actually wants a domain. You can't just like plug in a slider. It's not quite going to work. Okay. You need, um, a, you need to get a it works best with a you know like domain component. You see if you mouse over it in the upper right hand corner, it says it wants a domain. So let's go ahead and put in a domain component. And you want just a regular domain. It says creates a range from two numeric extremes. It lives under math here. Go to domain, domain. It has an A to B. So A is the start and B is the uh, finish. So let's just make these A and B. Pretty, pretty simple. Okay. Um, B and A. Okay. Let's plug this in. So, a range from 0 to 6.269, right? Whatever this range is. But watch this, though. See, I can change the bottom of it, too. So, I can say, give me a range of numbers from 3.5 to, let's say, 6. And give me nine steps and actually this is a problem with range so I, if I ask for nine steps uh, it gives me it's you know one two three four five six seven eight nine but you started with one so it actually gives you ten numbers if you look at this ten values that can cause a problem for you later so we'll just make note of it now but just it gives you it's nine steps but there's actually ten numbers and you'll see the points that it generates in the panel here, but it's actually easier if you just look at these. So check this out. <clears throat> this is three and this is uh, six, and we've given it nine steps in between it. So, and we can increase the range of it. Change that, change the number of steps. So it gives us kind of a, a like if we know where something's going to start and where it ends, we can, it gives us the number of stops in between. Okay. 
series is different because we don't necessarily know where it's going to end. We know what number we want to start with, which is similar to the beginning of domain here. We know what the increment is, uh, and we know how many times we want it, which is similar to the number of steps here. So this one actually figures out the increment. Like you, you don't you don't figure it out. The computer does. Um, but you give it the end. The other one, you specify the increment, and the computer figures out the end. Okay. These are both uh, useful in different situations, and we'll talk about this uh, in a minute. But so the two most important things, like right now, are the series and range components. And again, you know, they really alter um, what we've been working with, right? Because we're inputting multiple variables, and we're getting multiple uh, outputs. We're getting multiple points here. Okay. So. That's the beginning of this. Uh, next thing that I wanna I wanna do with this is just kind of play with it a bit. <clears throat> if you'll indulge me, I'm gonna go ahead and kill these panels here. Uh, you should use them until you really get used to uh, all this. And I'm gonna go ahead and move this stuff out of the way. And I'm gonna go ahead and put back um, a series component. And just keep all these. Okay, so we got an increment. You might get these better names than just the variable names. I always do that. <laughs> All right. All right. And then um, go ahead and plug these in. And actually, I don't. Yeah, let's see here. Still going to put these in for x. I'm going to make this 0. I'm going to reduce the mount here okay and we haven't used rectangle before but now uh, we can so rectangle and it's the rectangle don't confuse it with the uh, black hexagons that represent a collection use the shape the rectangle has this kind of base plane we know what we, we know what's going on with that uh, then it has the dimensions and the x and the dimensions and the y and it wants domains and we know how to deal with those now. Actually, in fact, I'm going to go ahead and just copy and paste these. These are pretty close anyway. <clears throat> go ahead and preview these off. So if you look at the domain here, it generates it. So it starts here, and it ends here in the x, and it starts in a direction and it ends in a direction in the y. So we just saw that with the range, but that's actually how right angle um, works. What I, we're used to doing though, what we're used to thinking about is like a width uh, and a length. And so what I want to do is actually do something a little bit, a little bit different than that. I'm going to go ahead and delete these and I'm going to put this into for both. And <clears throat> what you typically want to do is you think about like a like a rectangle. If you turn on the origin, if you had the same width, it'd be like say negative two this way and positive two right would give it um, a width of four. So that's kind of what we're going to do. We're going to take one of these and make it negative. And you could do a negative component. So just negative. which takes a number, right, and it outputs the, the negative of it. So if I plug this in, I get negative 1.66, and I can plug that in for A. The other thing you could do, be careful with this, is I can right-click on A, and you can do an expression. And this is a little bit of algebra, and what I can just do is just say, whatever A is, just give me negative A. And you'll see a little star show up, and that star will tell you what the expression is. And so this expression is the same as having this component. So if you get tired of these components, you think you know what you're doing, you can go ahead and use a little bit of expression um, magic. Okay. And so now, this is behaving more like a rectangle that we understand. The origin of it is the xy plane, so it's 0, 0, 0. And we've controlled it in the xy, taking a domain. Okay. If you wanted this to be a square, it would be really easy. You just take 
one of these domains and you plug it in and that way you're going to get the same information in the x as you are in the y and that's a square instead of a rectangle okay so rectangle is actually a square right parametrically okay so i've got that and then i've got these uh points and i can go ahead and make take an x x y plane and i can plug this in and i'm going to go ahead and turn those planes off ah don't have really have enough space between these yet so if i increase if i go to n you can increase the spacing so again these are parametric parametric uh, rectangles, okay? Okay, so you can do that, and that's interesting, right? And I can I can change these dimensions here, and then I'm essentially, since I inputted multiple values here, I get multiple copies of it, okay? Something else I can do is I can, I can start applying uh, transforms to them. So I could say something like uh, rotate I can plug this in. I can plug all the geometry into it. And then remember what rotate wants. It wants uh, planes for each one. And so what I need to do is actually go get an area component, plug in all the rectangles, so I get all the points. Okay. And then I have rotation angle and radians. So let's do radians. And I can do, let's make a number slider. I'll make it zero to three sixty. Okay, and plug this in. And okay, so you gotta hide this state. And then if I do this, you can see that I've got all of these rotating in unison. And maybe we like that, but you can do more interesting things than that. So we have the degrees, right? And we only put in one value for each of these. So all the geometry goes in and we have 13 uh, values for the rotation plane, 13 geometries, but only one value for the rotation angle. So they all get the same angle. Okay. If you want to do something different, you could put in these a range. Okay. And Just take these degrees sliders that we made. And so now I've got a domain, let's say 0 to 360, right? And the range is actually, uh, I need a number of steps, right? So I'm going to, I need, what I want is, I want 13 values, okay? And I want that to match the number of things I have. I, whenever I put something in a rotate, I want to match the number of things. I can't, I don't want to give this thing uh, two values or 14 values or 15. I want it to be 13. I want to match that data. If it doesn't match the data, you don't usually get what you want. Uh, sometimes there are reasons not to, but in this case, we want it to match it. So how do we get this n to always be the number of objects we have? Well, if you remember, we have this series here, right? Three. 12. So we plug this in for n, and then we get 13 values. Okay. Plug this in. Okay. And so now we've actually got this rotation. And check this out. Like, I can change the range. And you'll notice, actually, there's an, there's an extra one on the end. Right, and that's actually because again, this thing's giving us. Uh, it says twelve steps and twelve values, but we have thirteen values. So what we want to do is a little bit of quick uh, editing here on the expression. You'll notice this. I mean, look look on the end here. How there's two. There shouldn't be. There's an extra one on the end there. So what we want to do is just, and that's because we gave it. 13 values. Remember, whatever, if you plug in like a number of values, 
you're going to get, unless it matches up, you're going to get uh, more output, right? Just as how we, instead of plugging in one value here, we plugged in 12, we got 12 points. Even though we had 12 things here, we plugged in 13 values, and we end up with 13, because that's what the computer thinks we want. So we need to change this to the number that's right. So if, if we plug in 12, and we end up with 13, because it's actually 12 steps, let's just take n, go to the expression editor, and let's say whatever n is, let's do n minus 1. And there, that piece disappears. Okay. So, but check this out, though. I can change the rotation between, you know, two values. And that's getting, that's getting pretty cool. Okay. Probably want to clean this up a little bit. But. And we used range because we wanted a starting value and an ending value, but we didn't know what the in-betweens were going to be. And, and it's quite complicated it seems like it's like six decimal points we used a series to generate this and check this out it's still parametric it can still go through and edit the sizes of these if i'd like and i can go through and i can change the starting point i can change the distance between them change the number so very, starting to get interesting, right? And it's just like repetition, you know, uh, that really starts to get us into some interesting geometry, some interesting ideas with things. Okay. Let's go ahead and just for the for fun, let's go ahead and play with scale too. So if I go ahead and I add a scale component, scale takes geometry. You can see it's already starting to mess with it. Uh, then we need a center. And the center of scaling is actually going to be the same as the centroid we used for rotate, so that works. Now we've got these. And again, what can we do? What do we do? Uh, right now they're all scaled to 0.5, but what if we want to scale them to some different amount? We could do we could do different things, but let's continue this idea with a range. And let's just change these uh, to scale. I guess you could say scale start and uh, scale end. And <clears throat> scale is, is a percentage essentially, so these need to be much lower. Um, minimum scale would be 0 0.01. And that's because 0, right, doesn't work. It's not a scale. And let's say that the maximum scale is going to be three. Let me go ahead and change this one to, to three. Alrighty. And we got a range now. Well, they're both three, so that's no fun. 1.5 to three. Great. And plug it in for the factor. And we've got this now. And so now, you know, not only can we change these rotation, we can change them in the scale, and again, this kind of might seem like a toy at first, it's pretty interesting, but this is the, the foundation, the generator of lots of interesting um, kinds of designs. But So again, we saw how we can use components like series and range to change position, but we can also use them for transforms right? Like scale and rotate. And you better believe we can use it for move too, right? And we'll see that uh, in lab. Okay, we're going to talk about that in lab. So pretty interesting script here, you know, with these different uses and starting to get some interesting kind of abstract uh, logical patterns. Next thing I want to do is quickly show you uh, another way to input variables, to, to input information. I'm going to go ahead and uh, turn off most of this. Okay, and let's keep this piece on, and I'm actually going to remove these. <clears throat> Sometimes when you disconnect stuff, it uh, kind of breaks everything. So you just have to 
reconnect some things. So I'm going to go ahead and just reconnect this domain. And let's go ahead and make this zero and make this one. Okay, so we get a we get a domain from zero to one. And so what I've got right now are these uh, rectangles. And actually, let's go ahead and let's go ahead and put scale back in here. And area for the centroid. Okay, so we've got these rectangles here, and I got a range component. And then what I'm going to do is go to parameters, and you want to add one of these um, graph mappers. Okay, it's not doing anything yet. You have to right click on it, and we're going to give it a graph type of parabola. And a graph mapper uh, takes a range of values between 0 and 1, and it represents them with these like lines that are on here. And wherever it intersects the uh, graph, it returns a value. And so if we go to the panel, let's add a panel here. So it's returning uh, a range of values. And it's actually it's actually a parabola. So it's, so it's starts with one on each end, and then it's 0 0.6, 0 0.3, 0 0.1, 0 0.2. So it's actually creating this kind of arc condition here. Um, let's go ahead and put n back in. So now I've got 15 values. See 15 fine red lines here my values okay and that would actually probably be sufficient let's plug this in for F and you can see this let me go ahead and hide these points here or these area points so now I've got my um, pieces and watch this when I change the parabola when I change that graphing it's pretty wicked so the graph mapper just as the name implies, is taking these values and remapping them and putting them back into scale. And that's actually producing. So it's actually really a cool kind of effect. Let me go ahead and add a bit more. Yeah, there we go. So now the ones in the center are basically full height. <clears throat> and the ones that are on other parts uh, are almost down to nothing. And actually, they're negative in this case. But So that's interesting. You can also have different other kinds of graphs. So I can right-click, and I can go to graph types. And I could do something like, uh, let's see here, power curve. And so I can do things where they kind of graduate up and down. And it's cool because it's dynamic. Scale, it doesn't like this, actually, because it's one of them is 0. So let's let's change the range to uh, point 0.1 just so that we don't have any illegal values. In my uh, experience, it doesn't really hurt anything, but it's good not to do things the computer doesn't like. So, so that's a power curve. There's Perlin noise, which is essentially just, just kind of a sort of a pseudo-random curve. But it's kind of interesting, though. Conic. So you can kind of play with these a little bit. Seems kind of similar to power, but um, <clears throat> let's go ahead and give ourselves more more values, and because it's more fun. And let's go ahead and make this a uh, taller too. Okay, so now I can play with this a bit more. One of my favorite ones is to do a sine wave. And it starts off like, like this, and you can kind of play with the amplitudes. And that's kind of neat. But the really cool part is when you begin, and you pull this back, and then you can get these really great shapes. Again, we're kind of, we're fully parametric here. We can always go back and change different things about these, change the distances between them. Um, so this graph editor is really powerful, like just to visually understand, uh, what you're doing. You can go Desier, probably saw these in Photoshop. So again, I can 
I can kind of play with this. It'd be very difficult to figure out how to do this, like how to do the math for this, but graphically it it, uh, it works out really well. So that's the, the the graph editor. You can use this for rotation. You can use it for move. Again, all you're getting is a list of values that you're plugging in for some other thing. Okay. Let me show you a quick trick here with this too. Since your outputs are limited between zero and one, uh, that works great for something at scale, which really takes those different inputs. That's a fair range for that. But what you can do is you can plug these in, and then you can uh, do a, a a number slider with some range like say one to ten, and you multiply those amounts by something, and watch this. So let me plug this in. You can increase the amplitude of it by quite a bit. Okay, so if I scrub this, because again, I'm increasing the amounts. So it's just like this number times this number equals this number. Pretty cool. One uh, one other uh, thing that I can show you that's really useful for for visualizing <clears throat> is you can kind of put you can put the numbers directly on um, an object like it's a like you get like a label for something okay and um, let's see here yeah so you can do a tag components so if you go into point under tag. And you have a location of the tag. And in this case, the location might just well be the centroid. And then the text you want. And the text is probably, let's say, these number values. And then the size. Optional color. Um, but if you zoom in here, you can actually see the amount of each one. I think you change the size. If you right click it, yeah, you can change the size uh, to large or some other amount. I thought there was more control over this, but. So you can see them in the viewports, actually. And again, as we like, we like to visualize things you can see the numbers go up and down sometimes seeing the numbers of what you're doing is really helpful and that's the tag component you notice the tag has no output like that's it you put it in and that's that's what you get okay so that there's a lot of uh, <clears throat> a lot of new things there let's go ahead and start a whole new file And let's look at something else that's pretty interesting. Um, remember we had the circle? And a circle takes a base plane and a radius. So that's pretty, uh, pretty simple. Just gotta put a component in <clears throat> for a radius. Okay. And let's go ahead and do our thing with points again. So let's take a point XYZ and let's plug in a series. You can see it's already starting to work. Let's go ahead and grab couple more number sliders we'll call this one start I would call this one spacing and I would call this one number number of objects and let's just give this one one two three Okay, so I'm just kind of winging this here, but 
So we've got a list of circles, and we know that if we change the radius of them, they all change. But let me show you something else here. So if I take this list of numbers here, so these are essentially x coordinates, right? Which then become a series of points. Let's drop a panel. Always better to show than tell. Okay. Okay, so we got the panel looking good. And if we take this series of numbers and we plug it into another piece, so we're on the top here, what happens is that one and one, and so we, 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 we get this kind of thing. So you can actually plug in the same value and it's gonna give you uh, points in a, different, in a different location. And then that's gonna give you circles in a different location. You'll notice I didn't use an XY plane. Uh, I didn't plug the point into an XY plane before I plugged it in for the circle. Um, that's because I'm pretty much on the XY plane anyway uh, by default, and so I don't really need to do that. Um, but uh, I'll show you where that kind of thing is, is. It's useful to do planes. If I go to the front view in my uh, viewport, For some reason, it's not working, but uh, let's just go front. Okay, if we go to the front view, you can see everything's lined up. <clears throat> if I wanted these to be, let's say, the facade of a building instead of just this kind of, I always draw on the top view, but let's say we're really working on a facade. That's the ZX plane. And so I could put, or XZ plane, whatever. So I could drop these into an XZ plane. And now they're aligned with that view. Okay. So planes, planes do matter. I, I kind of, sometimes I'm kind of loose about that, but by default, uh, the points are in the, uh, they're going to, they're going to modify the, the XY base plane. But if you plug in a plane like XZ or, uh, YZ, that's going to change that direction. Remember YZ are the kind of east and west elevations. This is the kind of north south elevation. So let's pretend this is a facade. Okay. So I did that. And again, uh, and actually, right now, you can you notice that if I, d I did this in the Y, check this out. That's actually what's happening. They're actually kind of going back in space. So what I really would probably do would be something like um, put these in the Z. Because again, remember, I'm in the front view, <clears throat> and my axes have changed. OK, so you can see that Z coordinate, X coordinate, and that's what you get. And that's. That's kind of interesting. You get kind of a stair step. Um, but I'm going to show you something else here. So if I right click on Z and I go to graft, you get a grid. Okay. And this is, might be kind of hard to understand. And we'll talk a lot about it in class uh, multiple times. But we have a thing where if you plug in multiple values, right, you get, you get uh, a different output. Well, Think about this as kind of a loop. So before I plug in, you know, I have point one, and then the value comes in at the same time, that's point one. And then the next one goes in and it's point it's five and then it's five and, and so on. And so these coordinates have that. If I graph this, it says that these all have the same Z, like the first, so I have twenty. Let's just make this a lot smaller. Okay, so I have five objects, and they all have the same Z, and then I go to the next Z, and I have, so I have the sequence of X coordinates, 0, 5, 10, 15, 20, and then I have all these X's. So you can see it's like a row, so it's like, there's kind of a basket here. There's row 0, row 1, row 2, row 3, row 4, and each of these has five X values, but only one Z value. And that Z keeps incrementing. Okay. Just to show you for the sake of argument, you could do the same thing if you did a Z and you grafted it with X. So now the X's are, you know, 
in a group. These are kind of lumped together as point 0.1 or 0, and then the Z changes. Okay? And you can see that this thing actually turns kind of dash. That's because the data structure is uh, changed. If I look at this, it says I have 25 locally defined values, and it says N equals 5, N equals 5. So it's 25 values in five groups of 5. Okay? But we have a grid. And so, like, I can begin to increase these. And you already get some really interesting uh, kinds of things when you just have circles. Let's go ahead and play with this, actually. Just <clears throat> give us a lot of room here. I mean, when you do, what we've essentially created is a loop, right? It goes through the first, you know, five... And then it loops to the next one, and then it loops, and it loops, and it loops. Okay, so just we're like repeating it, but in a, in a kind of a pattern. We go across, and then we go to the next row, and we go across again in the next row. And so we had repetition, but now we have kind of like looping, because it goes back, and it goes, and it repeats back, and repeats back, and repeats. Okay. And then you can get these really cool uh, kind of geometric patterns out of it. Trippy. Okay. So grids are lots of fun. Uh, we can do we can do different things with them. I'm gonna go ahead and show you what happens when you do different things to it. So like if we have a scale and I'm gonna plug this in and go into area. Again getting all these different things at the right sizes. And so I've scaled them and, and these are being scaled um, by 0.5. So we need to mess with that scale. And what we could do with that is I could take the number of things and plug this in again. And you'll notice what now it's broken for the same reason it was last time we have too many components we need to do n minus one right because we started off with 19 and we want to end up with 19 so that's not broken anymore oh and the other difference is is that the domain we don't want this to end at zero let's actually give it something like that yeah 0.25 you always put sliders in and play with it too. So, um, so the scale, and what happens is that I've actually got 10, no, sorry, let's make this 10. And kind of change the spacing. See, that's the beauty of this whole thing. Okay. So I've got 10 numbers, and if I look at my things here, I've actually got these 10 rows. So each row gets a scale applied to it, if that makes sense. So we have quarter scale to one scale. So each row, this is kind of in the opposite, 0 0.25, one third, 0 0.416, all the way up to one. Okay. And so the data, um, you know, if the data doesn't match, uh, then the results change. So we didn't send it, let's see, what do we got? A hundred different values. We didn't send it one value, we sent it 10. And so that's where it uh, matched, okay? Just for the sake of experimentation, I'm not even sure what's gonna happen here, but let's let's change the data values. So you can see if I start adding some, it goes through the first 10 because that's what it has these groups for, right? Group one, group two, well, zero and one. Um, and then once it's done, it starts repeating it again at the top. And so that last one ends up getting it. And then watch if you don't have enough data, it's one and it just keeps repeating, which, you know, might be useful to you. 
Okay, so data matching. Let's check out something else here. Um, I'm going to go ahead and so graph created these kind of groups, which we then repeated in a loop. The opposite of graft is flattened. And what flattened does is it takes everything and it just destroys the uh, the hierarchy of it. And so you get, it flattens it, right? Everything has the same level now. Uh, and so you get 100 things. And now we have 100 things, but we have 10 centers of scaling, uh, 10 groups of centers of scaling, and we have four amounts and so you get some weird data matching so if we but if we flatten actually that's not working too well yeah let's go ahead remember we have to think about think about upstream and downstream let's go ahead and flatten these here and so we've got yeah 100 that's easier so we flatten it here and get 100 circles then we get all 100 of their points but we only have four amounts. Uh, you can see actually that the order kind of changes now that kind of goes up and down here. We can play with that later. But so you can see that the scaling only it goes in order this way. It goes in that order because of the order of the way that we created these um, points. If we change them to we flatten this. I'm oh, sorry. If we grafted this, yeah, then they would go this way. So the, the the original ordering comes in how you group them. So anyway, we've got these uh, amounts. Let's go ahead and do something interesting here. So we have a hundred things. How do we find out that we have a? I mean, how, how do we know that we have a hundred? You can check, you know, here. It's ten by ten. And so what we, what we can do is just do a multiplication, and then let's do 10 and 10, because that's always going to be what it's going to be. If I change it, 15 by 15 is 225. Plug this in, and now watch this. So now we actually have a thing that goes up, and it's going to go through all these values until it gets from 0.25, you know, all the way to one. Okay, now is the time we probably want to throw a domain in here and really do this thing uh, right. So we can have a minimum and a maximum domain. Then we can do kind of crazy, kind of crazy things. Okay. You don't even need this radius control anymore, actually. See how that affects it, though, if we if we mess with the radius and then we scale it, like how that changes it. So just kind of be aware of that. So we have all these different parameters that we can control here. But the idea is that, again, we kind of graphed it so that we can create a grid structure by kind of consolidating these into groups and then and then like repeating them. And then if you want to access the individual components to to address them, you know, in uh, sequence, you had to flatten them. But if we just work on the grafted structure, we don't have to do that. So again, if, I, if I'm working on this, if groups of 15, then I would go ahead and then just take 15 and end up with this structure. Okay, so pretty, pretty cool. You can also do uh, power curves. So if I did 0.1, and one. Same idea, I have 15 inputs and we just do, uh, uh, I mean, graph map are not power curves, but power curves are in there.
do some pretty pretty funky stuff. And this is a place where a multiplier <clears throat> would probably help too. Remember, we're just putting in a number slider and we're multiplying these values. Let's make this, I don't know, 10. Sorry, this gets a little confusing here. Okay. Um, yeah, and then this goes into scale. So now we can kind of play with this a little bit more. Zoom in and play with the amplitude of it. Sine curves are so much fun. I don't know if you had a lot of fun with them in high school geometry, but in architecture, they can be lots of fun. Because you get this kind of variance, you know, they, the value goes up, the value goes down. It's really uh, quite something. So kind of experiment with what these look like. Some of them, you know, maybe not so interesting. I really like, you know, like parabolas uh, and the sine ones. I think those are just pretty awesome. Okay, so that's a good place for us to stop. I just wanted to sort of established this idea of repetition and how powerful it is and how repetition can be applied to position and transforms like the things we did last time again we'll talk about move uh in the lab but i've shown you kind of scale and rotate uh and and how those are kind of useful um you know it's really important to use panels to kind of understand what's going on with the values at first um especially true when you're dealing with grafting and uh, flattening, okay? And if that seems a little confusing right now, uh, don't worry about that too much. We'll talk about that a lot. The important thing is to understand right now, like if you want to get this effect, like where you use those things. And remember, grafting is the key to getting those grids because that puts this into a group that then we can repeat, okay? And uh, that, that data structure is uh, very useful. And the biggest takeaway is this idea of that of that data structure the fact that like if you have a single input you get a single output if you have multiple like inputs you get multiple outputs if the inputs match the outputs then they respond to each other if they don't match each other things happen right sometimes weird things uh, if you don't have enough inputs then the system just keeps repeating the last input if you have too many then it's going to create new objects for those inputs so matching data uh, is really important, okay? So practice these, play with the graph mapper so you get a sense of that. Really understand the difference between series and uh, range, okay? And I will see you guys in class on Thursday.